Our first speaker is Johannes de Jong from Kone and an expert in elevators. And what I hope we'll see from this, from the abstract, is the extent to which we can actually gain imp improvements in performance by the control system, which I think is a, uh, has some remarkable figures which we hope to see. Would you please welcome Johannes? Hello, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and I hope the information I'm going to give you today is going to be very helpful for you. It's, this is actually one of my most important slides here. It is all about urbanization. It's an incredible mega trend and uh, here are some of the figures. I, I think you heard some of them this morning already. Uh, by 2030, there are going to be 2 billion more people living in cities. Altogether, approximately 5 billion people living in cities. And the number of megacities is rising, is doubling every 20 years. And with megacities, I mean cities with populations over 10 million inhabitants. So it's, it's an incredible opportunity for all of us. And I think everyone here has something with this business. So it's, it's good business. We have challenges related to that. And uh, the challenges can be seen here. Uh, more people means higher buildings, and higher buildings means we're going to need more elevators. Sorry, there's something here. Again, it doesn't work. Something went wrong here with the technology. And uh, it means that uh, we'll have more crowding, and use of space is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, one of the things is also we have to start looking at our resources and one of them is energy. So we have to put a lot of attention to that resource as well. The amount of energy we can use per, per capita is going to go down. We, we have to get in that direction and we have to get, oh here it is, yeah. So uh, here you have the environmental issues I talked about. And successful urbanization is a prerequisite for economic growth. If we don't get it done, then growth is not going to happen. We will have to get it done. So we're going to look at this from an elevator standpoint, but actually a lot of this stuff is also applicable to other trades. Now, how can we reduce the space used by elevators? And I'm going to go through a little bit of history here as well. Well, the simplest way is actually reduce the number of stops. Because if you have less stops, you can get around quicker, you can move around quicker, which means you've got more capacity, you need less elevators, you've got more space for people. Yeah, more space for the users. So it's a very important thing. Uh, for example, on this diagram here, we can actually do it with software, where we can have a building, uh, which normal system, uh, having a lot of stops going up, practically going to the top, but if traffic gets heavy, we just split it into two zones, a low rise and a high rise zone, and we can get around quicker. Yes, and if we can get around quicker, we have more, more capacity. Very simple. That's the easiest way, zoning. And we do it with buildings as well, zoning. The height you can reach with zoning is approximately 70 stories. So that's about 300 meters high, 1,000 feet high. So it's pretty high already. Yeah, but if you go higher, you need more. This is not going to work. Uh, you're going to fill your building up with elevators. So not, not a good thing to do. Not for, not for the guy who wants to make money. Uh, the next obvious is actually what I call space sharing. Putting two cars on top of each other and connecting them together. That's the double deck. And it was first introduced in 1931. Though the first ones didn't work very well, actually the system was very useful uh, to get more capacity out of it. Because you've got two cars in the same space, you, you save the space and you, you empty them at the same time. So again, you make the cycle faster, you get more capacity. But this is the second most obvious way of handling it. Uh, with these systems, you could actually go up to about 90 stories. That is about 360 meters high and clearly over 1,000 feet already. Uh, so this, this, this already starts being reasonably high, but if you want to go higher, you have to do even more. So let's see what we need to do next. Next, we start actually stacking buildings. 
Yeah, because if you have one building, uh, you actually see that the population doesn't increase very much, and you need less elevators. Yeah, so now we start stacking the buildings, and what you can do, you can actually stack elevators on top of each other, so you save the space. Uh, now we need an elevator, like that red elevator you see there, that red group of elevators there, uh, which takes you to the lobby of the second building, to the sky lobby of, of, of building number two. Yeah, so those are the shuttles to get there. Now, uh, this saves a lot of space again. With these kind of systems, if you use uh, conventional uh, single deck elevators for the locals, for the local zones, you can get up to 100 floors, about 400 meters high. And this, by the way, this is all for office buildings. Please, please keep that in mind. Uh, you can go up to 130 floors if you use double deck as the locals. Uh, for example, Type A 101 is using this, this system, for example. And uh, you still have reasonable travels on all the elevators. So. 130 stories, that's 500 meters, that's 500 plus meters, that's 1,500 feet, that's pretty high already. So you can go very, very high with these systems. If you want to go even higher, you actually need a third building. Yeah, so you start needing a third building. Now, I don't know if you dive. If you dive, one of the, the lessons you learn when diving is if you go underwater and you can't clear your ears, you can't, can't uh, get, get that pressure out of your ear, you should stop. Now, elevators are nasty, you can't just stop them. It's not the easy thing to do. And you do have pressure difference. So if you go actually all the way to a third building, which is 500 meters up, you can go in panic. So you have to remind, keep that in mind. You have body limitations here. So this is one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit later as well. There are smart ways of reducing stops as well. And one of them is whole call destination dispatching, where you actually give your destination on a keypad outside the lobby, outside in the lobby, and the system actually tells you which elevator to use. Uh, the result of that is very simple. Uh, instead of having a disorganized group as in, uh, in one of the corners there with uh, the elevators. Okay, so on the left hand side here, you will see that uh, there are a lot of people who, whenever an elevator arrives, they actually just jump and go for it. Yeah? So there's a lot of cross flow, there's a lot of disorganized uh, movement over there. Uh, okay, so on this side here, you'll see that there are a lot of stops as disorganized movement. Whenever an elevator comes, people just try to get there and get there as fast as possible. This system actually tells you which elevator where you have to stand for. So you're standing directly in front of the correct elevator and you can't even take another one because that's the as elevator assigned to you. But what it also tries to do is try to put people with the same destination in the same car. And if you do that, and this is actually the worst, I've, the, 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 the heaviest possible I've, I've designed here. Here you have three people going to, three stops on the, on the highest floor that's all concentrated on this elevator. What you do see is the amount of stops is dramatically reduced if you assign people with the same destination to the same car. And therefore you can get around much faster and you get more capacity again. And again, you can actually reduce the number of elevators needed. But putting people in the same car, or the same destination in the same car, is not always the best thing to do. I will show you that. Here we have a, an elevator just leaving from the ground floor, going to floor number 12. On floor number 7, there is another person wanting to go to floor number 12. So if I would put people with the same destination in the same car, it would mean that I would first have to pick up that person and then go to floor 12. Yes? So that's putting people with the same destination in the same car. However, there could be, because traffic is not always heavy, there could be an idle car on floor number six. There it is. Wouldn't it have been much better to actually pick up, uh, to go directly with car number eight to floor number 12, and then actually go with elevator number B, pick up that gentleman there on, uh, on the seventh floor, and then take him to floor number, number 12. There are now two cars going to floor number 12. What you now have is the person in car number A doesn't need to make the extra stop and lose time there. The person in, on floor seven doesn't need to wait so long for the car to get to floor number seven. Yeah? So both would have advantages out of this. So, Putting people in the same destination in the same car is not always smart. We can actually keep weights a lot shorter in low traffic if we 
give them the first arriving car. Another thing which is very important is when traffic gets heavy, we start actually changing the way uh, we, we serve the area. If traffic is low, we can serve the whole zone because we're not going to have a lot of stops, so any elevator can serve any one of the stops in the whole zone. If traffic gets heavier, we can actually start making the overlap smaller, but still so that every zone has about the same service. And if it gets extremely heavy, we go so far that we just actually don't, we start not having overlap. And we do it with contiguous zones, because with contiguous zone, you actually get the travel goes down. In the middle here, the travel, the average travel is to here. In this one, it's at the top practically, the average travel. And here it gets to mid-shaft approximately. Yeah, the travel. So by reducing the travel, we can also get around quicker and get more capacity. The result of that is the following. If, if these are the traffic intensities, and these are the waiting times, for example, in elevators, this red curve is a curve of a traditional elevator. At a certain fill rate, and you see those black numbers, those are fill rates, at a certain fill rate, you don't step in that car anymore, you have to wait for another car. So waiting times just saturate. With the destination system using the system where uh, people with the same destination are put in the same car, that's the green curve, you actually have longer waits with low capacity. Yeah? You saw that with the gentleman on floor seven, he had to wait a little bit longer. Uh, with uh, the smarter systems, you can actually keep waiting times equal to that of a conventional system. And with the contiguous zone, by reducing the contiguous zones, you actually get more capacity. You can even get more capacity instead of taking them over, uh, roughly, uh, randomly over that whole zone. Yeah? So if you keep them together, you can actually make that shorter as well. So you get more capacity and you keep the weights as short as possible. This is an incredibly efficient system to reduce elevators. Now, with these systems, you will see that you can go even higher now. Uh, the values between brackets here are the values for uh, existing the old conventional technology without whole call dispatching. Uh, the figures above, the figures here, they are the figures for whole call dispatching. And you can now see you can even get to 170 stories. That is pretty high already. So most of the buildings which are actually going on at the moment can be done with this kind of technology. I'm going to show you what the technology brings, what all the technologies bring. If you would make a building with 4,800 people, 52 stories, you would actually need three zones of eight elevators using conventional control. Yeah, low rise, mid rise, and high rise zone, all with eight elevators. That's 24. With whole call this destination and single deck, you could actually uh, bring it down to 18. Yeah, so even if it's slightly more, that's an investment which really pays back. You get a lot more shafts, a lot more return on investment, and your investment costs are going down, actually, even. So it's worth doing it. So you will see, like we've seen in, in Europe, uh, in office buildings, actually conventional control is dying out slowly. Conventional control uh, for double deck, uh, you see here, you would need to be able to do the same building, 16 elevators, 16. Now, double decks are about 1.6, 1.8 times the cost of a single deck, so multiply that with that factor and you see it's not worth competing against uh, destination control. So double decks actually more or less died. And we've seen a period where there were not a lot of double decks. Uh, to revive double deck, we've actually added uh, destination dispatching to double decks as well. And the first job is now actually being uh, done in London. It will be ready in London very soon. And this one going up, for, uh, for example, here in Abu Dhabi as well. Uh, with 13 elevators, you would be able to do it now. Now still, it's even more expensive technology. Let's double the price. It's, thir it's 13 times 2, it's 26. So it's still actually more expensive than whole call destination. But you save five hoistways. And that's re return on investment, which actually pays back big time. And we're now in a situation where we're actually more or less on par with, uh, between destination control and whole call destination. And for example, in cities like London, where rental costs are high, you actually see that all the buildings are turning towards destination double deck, even if they're only 30 stories high. So that's, that's a trend which we are already seeing now in London. And it's really happening now. Okay, there's another thing. In all these buildings, we have elevators going up all the way. 
yeah, going up all the way. Now, I just want to shock you because this is something where, which people do not talk about enough. Uh, one of the problems we have is that rope weight goes up exponentially. An elevator of 400 meters travel will use both suspension rope and compensation ropes to get about 8,000 8, kilos in ropes, yeah, going 400 meters up. If you want to go a, a kilometer up, this goes up to 68 tons with a minimum safety factor, 68 thousand kilos. Actually, the payload is starting to be less than 2% of the masses moving. So it starts being ridiculous in use of resources. Something we really have to look at. And this is only 1,600 kg. Another thing we have to look at, if at 400 meters we're using about 100,000 kilowatt hours with regeneration, with regeneration. At 1,000 meters, we're starting to see values of 700,000 kilowatt hours per elevator per year. So, is this sustainable? No. You can hardly call this sustainable anymore. So, we really have to talk about that. With present elevator technology, it's like flying to Mars. It can be done. It can be done. But with present day technology is not the wisest thing to do and we have to really keep that in mind. So I really please keep that in mind. Energy consumption, that's topic number two where I feel uh, people have made it too difficult to understand. What do we do in an elevator? We take you up to great height, lots of people to great height, and when they come back we actually get the energy back. So. What comes in comes back. That is if we would have 100% efficiency. Now, no machine is 100% efficient. So this box, which you see here, is actually representing a device. Motoring is, means we're actually needing energy from the network. Now, if you need to take energy from the network over the device, you're going to need more energy because you're going to lose some in the device. So the energy needed in the, at the network is 125, which is the, the energy needed divided by the efficiency of the device, 125. When we put it back to the network, the energy back to the network, we're going to lose some over the device. So now we have to multiply that 100 with the efficiency of the device and we get 80. Energy consumption is the difference of those two, 45. So we're going to use 45 energy units. Yeah? Now this is percentual, so please look at that. Yeah? But you can actually make good comparisons using this, this thing. And every device is a chain of devices. So we have here multiple devices, and if we work that out, geared, wortley and earth, we have 259 energy units. Asynchronic gearless, 198. We just left this device out. Here we leave this device out, and we're down to 108. Leaving more devices out, which is conventional asynchronic gearless, we are at 60. This is very similar. The only difference is efficiency of motors. Here we go from 0.8 to 0.9, and we see that energy is reduced to practically half. If you don't do that regeneration, I'll take the previous slide once quickly, you would have actually, if you don't do regeneration, efficiency is zero. You, you burn it away. So this will become zero and you'll see the energy consumption becomes 125. So you, by with regeneration, you can reduce energy consumption to a third of the total energy consumption. So regeneration is one of the most important things you need to do. Yeah? Other things are, look at speed. In small elevators, moving people is not going to use a lot of energy. The biggest amount is moving, is actually the, uh, the, the light, fans, these kind of things, standby energy. With high-speed elevators where we move a lot of people, this becomes only 10-15%. So we have to focus on different things. I'll show you Swiss Re here, a big job. 254,000 kilowatt hours saved by, by using, and we still have non-regenerative elevators here. Yeah? Every loss we have, we need about a third of the kilowatts to pull it out of the building. So we can add another 80,000. If you do this, actually, you will see that you can save approximately three months of free, you get three, three months of free service paid back out of the energy bill, and over the lifetime of an elevator, you can actually get the whole cost of a zone back. That's how much you get back. In, if we compare different buildings, different types, you can see that with uh, 
DC technology, the old technology which we had about 20 years ago, we would have 6% of the energy consumption of the building. Uh, with VVVFAC, which is the most common used in high-rise buildings now, it is four. With EcoDisc, it's only two. Quick conclusion. Modern control algorithms have raised possible building heights uh, for uh, single sky lobby buildings to 170 floors. A third stack building is needed if you want to have travels up to 200 floors or to over, over 200 floors. But uh, full travel elevators can hardly be seen as ecological anymore. Energy consumption has dramatically reduced over the past 20 years with the introduction of permanent magnet motors. And uh, when we look at the devices in that, we are all practically near unity. So it's very hard, we, we are very near an optimum situation, and it's very difficult to increase the energy uh, reduction further because we're so close to unity. However, focus now has to shift to that standby energy and reduce that energy consumed by other devices in the system. And last but not least, zero energy is actually really possible. Even energy producing elevators are possible if we combine them uh, with uh, technology, energy uh, capturing technologies such as solar panels. And we already have these kind of elevators in operation. Thank you.